waiting in our old familiar place. An empty spot beside me where I used to wait. Hi, this is Angel with you. Join us to get real. And uh, here is Pastor Jake. And a Khaleesi Cafe and Piano Bar and Bible Study. <laughs> Angel. Yes, Pastor. Hey, have you seen the waitress? No, she must have got tired of traffic, but no? I can take care of it. Oh, you're taking care of everybody? Okay, that's cool. Well, I'm glad you got my coffee. It's really good. Thanks. It's a new blend we're trying. Bristlecone blend. Oh, a new blend? All right. Mmm. That tastes good. All right. And, uh... Just one thing. What? May I ask you something about your wardrobe? <laughs> Do you my, ever change your clothes? Well, uh, yeah. I wear the same thing. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I wear the same thing on the show, but it's not dirty. I do change clothes. Is, is there a reason? I, I wear the black because uh, I think it's a little bit better for the camera and less distracting from what we're teaching. Ah. And it's not for any reason, religious reason particularly. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> You're funny, Angel. Okay, well, let's get to the teaching, and we'll talk a little later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, thanks for telling me. Anyway, this, this one is called All He Asks. All He Asks is a heart for God. Okay, the parable we're going to uh, study right off today is illustrating that faithfulness we should have for one another and how that would prove men worthy of God and that no man can serve two masters you've probably heard that one before and we go right off to the today's new international version Luke 16 1 it says Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, too. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Three, the manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job, and I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg for, I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Five. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, those who owed money to him, and asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Six. Nine hundred gallons of oil, he replied. Uh, the manager told him, take your bill, Sit down quickly and make it for 450 gallons of oil. Seven. Then he asked the second one, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. Eight. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly, shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. In biblical times, households had chief servants. He was a manager for the house. He was like a boss of the servants and personally watched that they did their work properly. And he was personally responsible for his master's property and business. He was also the one who would train up the ones who would someday be heirs to the master's household. The chief servant was expected to be highly regarded and trustworthy by the master. Let's see an example in the first book of the Pentateuch, those 12 books that Moses was supposed to have written, the book of Genesis. There we go. Today's New International Version, Genesis 24.1. Abraham was now very old, 
And the Lord had blessed him in every way. This is Abraham. Two, he, he said to the senior servant in his household, so Abraham had a senior servant, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. Three, I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living. Four, but go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. So he sent out his servant to do this, the, the main guy he trusted to do it. And as you know, it worked out good. So in the book of Genesis, we see the service of a senior servant, as Abraham calls him. We also know that this servant was successful in finding Rebekah for Isaac's wife. And Rebekah was Abraham's grand niece, indicating that God's hand was definitely on the senior servant to go to just the right place at the right time to get this wife for Isaac. Back to our parable, we see that the chief servant had wasted the owner's possessions. I don't see the scripture saying that it was done in a particularly malicious way. But nevertheless, he had formed in a way where he could not be trusted anymore. Let's look at his next actions in light of the verse of Luke 16, 8, that says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Remember? We wrote, just read that. Meaning a believer in, in the light of Jesus Christ. This unjust chief servant was more than likely just thinking of himself now. He's starting to look at himself as just one of the regular people again. <laughs> have to get a job. So to be politically accepted by all, he comes up with this plan. The master was very impressed with the way this guy was able to get out of this situation. The servant had cut most of the debts almost in half, which made the debtors happy, and probably collected debt which made the master happy. But actually it was deceiving him somewhat by covering up what he should have received. The point of the parable is to show how worldly men and their scheming to provide for their own personal greed are sometimes wiser than most Christians in their plans and projects to serve God. Is it the far-seeking wisdom that is commended here? In heaven, when God created the angels, he gave them a self-will to choose who they would serve. As a result, one-third of the angels choose to follow Satan and became what we call the fallen angels. On earth, when God created man, he gave man, too, a self-will to make his own decisions. After learning of God's desires and directions for man to obey or disobey, Adam and Eve chose to be disobedient. And their seed of sin fell on all of mankind until Jesus. I believe that God gave angels and man their free will so that eventually they would realize how vulnerable they really are. And that soon, by faith and obedience, they would choose to follow God. We are able to see this faith and obedience in men like Abraham and Noah. Even though Noah failed in an incident recorded in the Old Testament and was denied going into the promised land, Joshua had to go, still his failings are a witness to the freedom we have in faith. God knows all and knows each man's heart and his failings, and the Holy Spirit is continually working to change that direction of man by changing his will to please God. It is clear that man's will is his worst enemy. The devil doesn't have to do much. <laughs> he just sits back and watches the show. A great performance of man destroying himself.
Suppose we have a little wind-up soldier here. A little wind-up soldier. Have you got a wind-up soldier back there, uh, nope. Angel? <laughs> Not as a no, rule, okay. Pastor Jay. <laughs> you don't keep him as a rule. <laughs> well, we're just going to suppose <clears throat> we have this wind-up soldier here. We wind him up. <coughs> and we put him on the piano bar. We turn him on. He would surely walk right off the piano bar and fall on the floor. <laughs> Several times. I don't care how many times. Several times you do this. Now, if it were possible to install a chip in this toy, like we have nowadays, a, a chip, a computer chip, so that it would realize that once it came to the edge of the piano bar, it was time to stop and go into another direction and go back this way, maybe. Then soon, we could trust that we wouldn't have to keep picking him up off the floor. God is seeking this kind of trust in us. When we're about to walk off the piano bar, <laughs> we had better consider our options. If we would consider that, let's call it, that we could call it a chip that's in us, that Holy, the Holy Spirit that God has put in us, that God is in us by His Holy Spirit, if we consider, consider He is there with us, then we realize that we are turned on to a far-seeking wisdom that only God can give us and that will keep us from falling off the edge of whatever we're getting to. We just seek God. He's there to guide us and protect us and to hold us back from making wrong decisions. Let's continue now in our chronological study of the first four Gospels of the New Testament. Today's New International Version, Luke 16. We're continuing on now. 16.9. It says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That's different. 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. 11. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, ah, who will trust you with true riches? 12. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's where we get that one. If we take Luke 16, 9 out of context, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. <laughs> This would be great news for a lot of new believers who are trying to climb the ladder of success as Christian capitalists. Many have tried and many have failed and have come to ru ruin. Why? Even some ministers and large Christian organizations have done the same. <laughs> Why? What did Paul teach his disciple Timothy? We're going to look at that. Maybe we can get something out of that, okay? Today's New International Version, 1 Timothy 6, 9. It says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. In balance and context with Paul's letter to Timothy, we now understand God is asking to use worldly wealth to gain friends. If not asking you to do that, then what am I asking you here? Certainly not, unless it were only to glorify God by giving it away. Worldly wealth, get the worldly wealth and use it to glorify God. 
then he can trust you and he'll even give you more <laughs> to work with your own property you could become very rich and obtain everything that you've ever wanted when your heart is right and you 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 use it to glorify the lord in verse 10 13 we see the true meaning of verse 16 9 we as Christians should be faithful and diligent with little as well as with much. If we just have a little bit, we glorify God. And if we have much, we glorify Him. And then He gives us even more. If that's our heart, He reads our hearts too. Maybe He, he sees that we don't really want a lot of things. We're not into a lot of material things or the latest stuff that Jones has had. In fact, we're told not to covet our neighbors and what they have. But if he sees we can enjoy these things and also use them for his glory, look at King Solomon. He gave him everything. If we can keep the root of riches from growing into an idol separating us from God, then we have done well. God has seen that we have only been careful with the riches that tempt men to sin in order to enjoy our own sin, then how can he trust us with true riches either? So if, if we're really getting into all this stuff and we're getting rich and we're using it for me, if we're using it for that... I'm the man! I'm the man! I'm the I man! I know. <laughs> you see that commercial? Oh, man? you're so funny, Angel, I tell you. I guess it's God's do children you, are funny. Do you pile up riches and, and uh, flaunt it in front of everyone? I bought a new car. Well, I know you have a nice car. It's the best I've had. And you drive around and... I use my bike more. Oh, I see. Okay. My car belongs to God. That's great. And he'll show me how to use it then you do glorify God. And all you do with your money, then you know what we're talking about here. Then he'll give you more, angel. God provides our needs, huh? With a name like that. Do angels get paid? You know better. Amen to that. Okay, where was I? What are true riches? I sense that true riches are referring to our place in, the, in his kingdom. We cannot serve two masters at the same time the scripture says if we only serve god we will end up with god as our master in his eternal kingdom well there's not much uh, choice there for me <laughs> i want to be with god in his eternal kingdom it says eternal wealth what did the scripture say that we were reading there Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, when the wealth is gone, maybe when we leave this world, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Eternal dwellings. Remember, Jesus says he's gone to prepare a place for us, the eternal dwellings. He has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of this promise. Let's finish our assigned scriptures for today. Today's New International Version, continuing on now Luke 16, verse 14. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard of this and were sneering at Jesus. 15. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others. God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So God know, knew their hearts and he said, I know what you're thinking and feeling and what people value highly is detestable to God. The things that people value highly are the idols that God detests to put nothing before him. We learned this originally when God turned men and women over to lust after one another because they were being disobedient and lusting after images. So God turned them over to lust after one another. He says, you think you're enjoying this, this lusting? Well, try this. The toy wind-up soldier we talked about has no heart or ability to make decisions. Yet he is as good as an idol that we worship, as many of the statues and images we bow down to and serve 
Even today, I don't care if they're even religious statues. But we do have a self-will of our own and God's power to do all things. When we, by faith and God's help, take the idols out of our hearts, we then have a heart for God. And he sees that. This is all he asks of us. We think religion is so difficult. Well, we try to make it that way in a lot of churches, but God is just saying, take that stuff out of your heart. Make me the one, the only one in your heart that you desire to serve me and do my will. Take all the other idols, all of the other stuff in there that's important to you. Take it out of your heart. It's okay to have it. You can have it around you, but not in your heart. That's all I ask. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your promises Nothing seems worthwhile Except to be In your kingdom of love My Lord